On The Gary Bisbee Show, hear practical lessons from today's healthcare insiders. We'll uncover stories about their challenges, paths to success, and the skills that they've developed, as together, we'll explore how the healthcare economy is transforming. What do you do next after graduating from the University of Minnesota's Aeronautical Engineering Program and playing four years of varsity baseball? Of course, you go design F-16 fighter jets. Our guest today is Bill Lynch, who has held virtually every senior leadership position at Delta and was asked by Ed Bastian, Delta CEO, to create a new position, Chief Customer Experience Officer. We asked Bill how he felt about accepting Ed's request nine days before coronavirus was declared a pandemic. For those of us in healthcare, it's always instructional to learn from executives in other industries. Delta and healthcare have much in common since both industries are highly regulated, competitive, and have a dependence on data and its accuracy. Delta customers are interested in price, convenience, and safety, all of which are becoming more common for customer expectations in healthcare. Bill shared his views of how to structure the customer experience role. He worked through how his team identifies the primary interests of customers and how that has evolved over the last 15 months during COVID. He discussed partnerships with Mayo and Emory and why Delta created a chief medical officer role. Delta kept the middle seat in coach open well after the competition were selling theirs. You'll find Bill's rationale instructive for operating a customer-centric organization. Delta is one of the largest U.S.-based airlines with pre-COVID 5,400 flights daily, serving 325 destinations in 52 countries. There's much to learn from this conversation with Bill about leadership, organizational culture, and customer-centric strategy. And of course, for those of us that are frequent flyers, how Delta can be number one in on-time arrivals. Well, good afternoon, Bill, and welcome. Good to be with you, Gary. How are you today? I'm well, thank you, and welcome to the microphone. We're pleased to have you here. It's been a hectic year for uh, all the airlines, and uh, so we're delighted that you took a minute out to be with us. We'd like to get to know uh, our guests, uh, dig into their backgrounds a little bit, just figuring out motivations and so on. So what was life like growing up for you, Bill? Well, I'm from a family of seven children, um, a very close Catholic family raised in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. I had four older siblings and two younger, so I was kind of lost in the middle of the pack there for a period of time. But um, uh, my family played a lot of athletics, both boys and girls. My father was very involved in athletics. And so during summers and even during the school year, we were constantly on the run, going from ball field to ball field, from gymnasium to gymnasium. And it's remarkable. My father worked hard to support the large family. And I know he and I know he did well in his profession, but it just amazes me that he was able to stay on top of the schedule that we had. He was at every practice, he was at every game. Um, he was really an incredible support. So a very active family, really involved in athletics and uh, spent a lot of time during summers out running around in the street, in the backyard, in the front yard, pickup game after pickup game. Well, I know you play baseball at Minnesota. Was that your favorite sport? Baseball was my favorite sport. I had a brother who played professional baseball. And uh, in fact, he was a teammate of a uh, high school and a college teammate of Hall of Famer Paul Molitor. I grew up in the area of Paul Molitor and Jack Morris and Dave Winfield in St. Paul. So for a uh, small town that's tucked in uh, kind of the Midwest where you don't necessarily expect uh, baseball players to be bred, there was a lot of good baseball around. So these were my idols as I was growing up watching them play ball. And so I wanted to be like these guys were and spent a lot of time hanging around the ball field watching them. And uh, that's where I grew my love for baseball. Well, what about aviation? You must have a love for that as well. When did you be first become interested in aviation, Bill? Well, if, if I remember correctly, I was probably three or four years old. I had an uncle. His name is Al, but I called him Uncle Airplane. He flew in the Air Force, uh, active duty for some period of time. And then he went into the reserves after and lived in Florida. He was based out of Homestead Air Force Base, but quite often, he would fly his aircraft along with the crew 
up to the Twin Cities, uh, to the reserve base here. When he did, my father, his brother, would take me out to the airport to spend some time walking the airplane. I'd get a little bit of time sitting in the cockpit, have the yoke in my hand, and steer it left and right. And that was where the fascination for aviation started. And then throughout my entire life, through grade school, high school, college, and into my professional world, I've always had some bit of aviation or maybe a lot of aviation rolling through my blood. I've never been able to get rid of uh, the aviation blood. But it was my uncle who got me started back uh, when I was four or five years old. Well, you majored in aeronautical engineering at the University of Minnesota, so you studied formally at that point. Uh, where did you go out of that program? What was your first position? While I was at the university playing baseball, just as a little bit of an aside, there were very few engineers who were on the baseball team, all great guys, but um, the engineering program along with the baseball um, schedule was a little bit of a challenge. So when we, we didn't fly at that time. We, were, we would travel, uh, play Big Ten games uh, you know, in Champaign, Illinois. We were in West Lafayette, Indiana. We'd go to Iowa City, and we were always on the bus. And I had to sit in the front of the bus in order to get my studying done while everyone else was playing cards in the back of the bus. So um, when I finished my degree at the University of Minnesota, the first role that I took was at General Dynamics in Fort Worth, Texas. I spent two and a half to three years of my career, the first two and a half to three years, as a wing and tail designer on the F-16 fighter jet. So it gave me a really good appreciation for the manufacturing side of the business. And my, my degree was aerospace engineering with a concentration in structures. And being able to work structures on such a fascinating, incredible machine like the F-16 was a great way to start dipping the toe in the water after after college. Just enjoy, thoroughly enjoyed that job. After building wings and tails uh, for the F-16, did you go immediately to Northwest or what was the connection that got you to Northwest Airlines? So my wife and I are both from the Twin Cities area and we really enjoy living here. And it, the next stop wasn't Northwest. I spent a year working for a local company that built full-scale static and fatigue test systems to test aerospace vehicles. So these are the structures that you would put a full-scale airplane in and simulate the service life of an airplane to get a sense for where it had structural deficiencies. So the Boeings and at that time McDonnell Douglas, Airbus, they were, they were the purchasers of these systems. And then in 1989, was when I started my career with Northwest Airlines as a structures engineering in the maintenance division. What came next? Of course, there were a variety of bankruptcies uh, in the 2000s. It was a tough time for the airlines business, but ultimately Northwest and Delta merged and uh, you went uh, with Delta, but what was it like to go from Northwest with its culture to Delta with its, its culture? It must have been must have been different. Two very different cultures, but I would say very complementary cultures. So just to put this in perspective, I had 19 to 20 years of experience with Northwest Airlines at the time of the merger. And now since then, have had another uh, 10, 11 years with, uh, with the merged company. Actually, 12 years now that I think about it. So 12 years with the merged company. So roughly 31, 32 years in the business. Northwest was very, if, if, if nothing else, it was very disciplined around operational performance, using big data to understand how the business is running, and then leveraging that data to drive improvement in the operations. So in the, in the decade of the 90s, Northwest was really known very well as the on-time machine, and it was top in class in on-time performance and completion factor performance or cancellation, we call it completion factor performance, uh, uh, best in bag handling performance. Delta, on the other hand, had this incredible focus on people, on the customer, on its employees, had an incredible brand. And the combination of the two makes for what I believe is a top airline in the entire airline space. When you look at reliability, when you look at customer service, you look at the quality of the brand, you look at the financial performance, the combination of all that 
came together very nicely. So I would say um, two very different cultures, two very complementary cultures, but the transition was not easy. Um, if you were in the Northwest space before the merger, more of a unionized environment, uh, very focused on operational reliability, re reliability delta, less so on the unionized front, um, uh, but real focused on that direct relationship with, with employees. And the Northwest employees um, weren't real sure about what that was all about because it wasn't the environment that they had grown up in. But today, across the board, and we, we see this in the survey data that we get back from our employees, we do a lot of employee surveys internally, the level of engagement, are you proud to work for Delta? Um, is Delta a, a, a place that uh, you enjoy working for? We have three questions that we ask. The engagement scores are as high as they have ever been. So a real successful combination of the two cultures. Well done. Well, as a frequent uh, flyer myself, uh, and I fly a lot of Delta, I think the culture, uh, looking at it from the standpoint of a customer, is just terrific. So congratulations there. During your time at Delta, and I assume at Northwest, but for sure Delta, it seems like you've led almost every piece of Delta Airlines at one point or another, uh, what would you say is your favorite uh, posting in terms of uh, leading different units? So Gary, over my 31 plus years with the airline, the majority of that time has been in the world of operations and customer service. I've had airports, I've had flight operations, in-flight operations, I've had maintenance responsibilities, operations centers, been around the horn at various levels, and my favorite role of all of those has been leading the airport operations. I had not only, at one time I had responsibility to run the hub in Minneapolis on the, on the airport side, but from that role, then I moved into uh, to having responsibility for all global airports. And at the airport, where all of the hard work of our pilots and our flight attendants and our mechanics and our ground workers and our res agents and all of the support staff that go behind it, our cargo agents, I don't mean to leave anyone out, but it all comes together for the customer at the airport. So for me, having the opportunity to see how all of those components come together and ultimately serve the customer as we push back on time with their bag, we give them a smile, uh, send them on their way, and in, in many cases, they're off to something really exciting, uh, really uh, motivating, real, uh, maybe a big family event. It's wonderful to see all of that come together. That's, that's I think, where I got the greatest satisfaction. I have loved all my roles, but the one I've enjoyed most is where I see the Delta product and Delta service come together collectively and meet the customer. Well, your current role, the Chief Customer Experience Officer, I think you took shortly before COVID, didn't you, Bill? It was probably nine days before COVID was declared a pandemic. And I, I, I regularly am asked the question, Gary, is, wasn't that just horrible timing? And my response to that is the timing couldn't have been better. It's the first time in our history at Delta that we've had a chief customer experience officer and probably never before was there such a need to have this intense focus on changing customer expectations and needs. And so being able to bring all of those organizations responsible for delivering the experience to the customer together into one organization, I think put us in a position where we could listen act, listen very quickly, and, and, and adapt to the changing needs of the customer, whether it was around their, their desire to understand what it was we were doing to keep them safe, what we were doing to keep them safe. Uh, maybe we, we don't want to serve as much on board the airplane at this time because there's some concern about the number of touch points between flight attendants and the customers. So we decontented the, the catering for a period of time. Just having the opportunity to put all of the leaders of those functions together in a room and have a conversation around what we're hearing from the customer and what we need to do to address it. Uh, the timing could not have been better. And the team, as a result of this, the team has really developed a great rapport, has uh, developed an incredible level of camaraderie, 
And I haven't, over the course of this last year, year and maybe a month, I have not heard anyone on my team say, that's not my job. Everyone has been willing to pitch in for whatever it takes to serve the customer. That's terrific and, and really needed in this kind of environment. Uh, you made the decision to take the position before COVID. What was your thinking at that point, Bill? At that point, the thinking was uh, we have, over the course of the, the previous 11 years of the merged company, so Northwest and Delta, we have really we have really developed and we continue to hold what is considered to be a real premier position as far as operational reliability goes. So we had really tuned up the game. Now we're never, we're never completely satisfied with that, but we had come a long way in driving great operational performance. And the thought then was what we need to now really amp up the game while we've, we have great employees who deliver great service and have for some time and the feedback from the customer has been great. What can we do? to elevate even further the experience for the customer. What was this vision for customer excellence, customer service in three to five years? And this is one that our CEO, Ed Bastian, laid out uh, at CES in Las Vegas back in January of, of last year, so January of 2020. This vision that we have for what life is gonna be like as a customer traveling on Delta in a few years. And so bringing the teams together who have to execute on that was really what this was all about, elevating that experience to meet the vision that we rolled out at CES in January of 2020. How do you go about setting priorities? First of all, it's a new position. The first one Delta had, secondly, COVID was right there. So how do you think about setting priorities for that position? Well, it's really simple. This is not, uh, this one's not rocket science. It's really about listening to the customer. What are the customer's needs? What are their expectations? And how do you exceed those? So whether it's through survey programs, it's through focus groups that we have, or any other means of gaining insight from the consumer. We have an organization of consumer insight specialists um, analysts who do a lot of work in this regard to give us an understanding of the changing needs of the customers, not only today, but where are they going to be in the future? And what is it that we then need to design and execute on in order to meet that need? So it's really about listening to the customer. They are the ones who help us determine the priorities. Now, we can't chase everything. And there is a limit to what we can invest in. And then at, at that point, we have to start thinking about what are the best what are the best initiatives to go after, given the limited resource that we have to uh, achieve the, the needs, the expectations of the customer? So we first listen to the customer, and then we have to put a little bit of uh, business management around that. But the customer guides us. How would you say the customer um, concerns or interests have evolved over the last year or so during COVID? Just before the pandemic, Delta was coming off. It's sixth year of, of record profitability and and paying out profit sharing to our employees. Things were good. We were ready to make significant investments in things like, you know, you know more digitization, um, self-serve types of, uh, of interfaces with the customer, make investments in airports, et cetera. And then COVID hit. And of course, uh, the customer's needs changed dramatically. Their focus was no longer on schedule and no longer on pricing. It was really around, are you going to help me social distance? And are you going to clean your facilities and your airplanes um, much more than you had in the past? And while we were proud of the product we were putting forward, customers told us we needed to do more. So we went through our airports and we went through our airplanes. We went through the entire travel journey that our customer goes through to identify what could we do to meet their needs around social distancing, cleanliness, and ensure that customers who did business with Delta um, were appropriately wearing their PPE. These, are, these were responsibilities that our flight attendants and our agents in the airports were not hired to do, but we were asking them to help us enforce these kinds of things because we, we make a promise to the customer about what they're going to experience when they get to Delta. Very clean, well sanitized, appropriately distanced, everyone wearing their PPE to make them comfortable. That's what the consumer 
wanted. And for the majority of the past 12 months, that's what they've wanted. We've now started to see a little bit of a shift. They still want that, but they expect that that's kind of table stakes now. And now we're getting back to schedule. Are we giving them the flights at the time they want it? Pricing, are we providing a very competitive price, good value for the product that we're delivering? So we're starting to see as people are learning how to live with COVID, vaccination rates are going up, the immunity levels are going up, not yet to herd immunity. But as we start seeing the demand come back, we're starting to see a shift away from social distancing and cleanliness back to schedule price and some of the amenities that we're delivering on board, whether it's food and beverage, the in-flight entertainment, those types of things. Did you form any partnerships over the course of the year to help? I know uh, Dr. Ting is now on board, but uh, how did you think about uh, getting clinical expertise involved? We're expert at operating airplanes and getting people safely and reliably, along with their baggage, to their destination. We're not experts in cleaning. We're not experts in the medical field. And so we spent a, a good amount of time evaluating partnerships with those who we believe are. So we developed a partnership with the Mayo Clinic, with Emory Health. We developed a partnership with um, Lysol, with Purell. And so we've, we've brought these experts together with us and we've developed this collaborative approach to designing out what it is that we are delivering, not only to our customers, but to our employees who need to feel safe as well. So through that partnership with Mayo, we got to know Dr. Henry Ting quite well. And then over the course of the year, um, he expressed interest and we were very interested in bringing him on as our very first chief health officer. Uh, the very first that, that we know of in the airline space. And uh, this is all about our commitment that this focus on cleanliness and the well-being of our employees and our customers is not just here for COVID. We're making a long-term investment in changing this component of the brand. Our customers should expect going forward that the level of cleanliness, the standard that we've set, the focus on their well-being is not going to diminish when COVID becomes a thing of the past. It seems to me that um, there have been a bit of a sea change among the airlines in terms of this focus on cleanliness and safety and so on. Do you think that will continue? Is that actually going to be changed that, let's just say Delta will incorporate going forward and it's gonna be you know, kind of a sea change in how uh, you treat that those issues of safety and cleanliness and so on? Sure. I can, I can speak, Gary, for Delta. I don't know what the other carriers are thinking, but today we have, in my organization, I have a vice president of global cleanliness, and on his staff are about 200 individuals, including nearly 100 cleaning ambassadors who are out at our various airports overseeing the cleaning process with our cleaning suppliers. That's, that's an organization that didn't exist a year ago. That's an organization that will continue, as far as I'm concerned, indefinitely, forever, because our focus on safety is, is not going to change. We set a standard for cleanliness. The global cleanliness team went out and executed against that. In fact, they've, they've overachieved in my mind there, and our, our customers telling us the same thing. But now what I'm asking them to do, whether it's onboard sanitization and cleanliness of the aircraft, or if it's in our airport facilities, along working alongside the TSA and the CBP and others who, who help process our customers, to our general offices down in Atlanta, um, I'm asking them to continue to innovate, find new ways, not giving up on the standard. In fact, I want them to continue to elevate the standard, but let's look for new ways uh, for surface cleanliness, for air cleanliness, um, ways that we can ensure that going forward, our customers and our employees believe they have, that we have their well-being as our top priority and they feel incredibly confident coming to work or coming on board our airplanes. About six weeks ago, I think it was, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal about the middle seat and how Delta was not selling the middle seat in coach. 
And I believe uh, Delta was the last airline to keep that middle seat open. Um, I think you um, uh, are going to begin to sell the middle seat going forward now. But what was your thinking about that, Bill? And what's caused you to uh, decide you can now sell the middle seat? So back when we made this decision, which was probably the April, May time frame, even though there wasn't enough demand to fill up our middle seats, we made the decision that as, as demand starts coming back, we were going to protect that middle seat and give space to our customers. Initially, it was a little bit of a, it was, a, maybe I shouldn't say a little bit, but it was, it was more safety focused because we really didn't understand how COVID was transmitted at that time. We didn't understand whether it was through aerosol droplets or respiratory droplets, or if it was, you know, surface transmission. So initially there was the focus on safety, but as we became smarter and smarter about this through the help of our partners to understand that it was primarily through respiratory droplets, we, we convinced ourselves, um, Dr. Ting and the, and the Mayo staff, as well as the staff on our advisory board, we have an advisory board of medical experts that's more than just the Mayo Clinic. We, we were convinced that, that it was safe to sell the middle seat, but the customer was telling us they still wanted their space. And our approach back nine months ago, we were very vocal about this. Our approach is very value-centered. And, it's, and, and we've said this so many times in public, it is people before profits. We weren't going to play the long, or we weren't going to play, excuse me, the short game and chase the, uh, any bit of revenue that we could and fill up our seats. We were going to go after the longer game, which was really about building confidence and trust in the brand, making customers feel as safe and as comfortable as they possibly could believing that they will remember for a long time how they were treated during this crisis. And so as we approached this uh, deadline that we had set up for a decision, we, we were public a couple months ago that we were going to keep the middle seats blocked through the end of April. And it was time to make a decision. We put all of the inputs together in this decision and the assessment of all of the input. And it was it's safe. We're comfortable that it's a, it's safe to do, provided that uh, our our customers are appropriately masked and our employees have been doing a nice job ensuring that whether it's in the airport or on board the airplane, people are appropriately masked. But then also getting some feedback from our customers, not only um, those who've been traveling, but those who haven't been traveling yet, um, our corporate customers particularly who haven't been traveling. Are you comfortable now as we get as we get ready to make this decision, are you comfortable having us sell the middle seat? And the, the feedback that we're, we were receiving is as people become more comfortable on how to live with this virus, they were becoming comfortable uh, with the middle seat being sold. So we made that decision in the middle of March and the feedback that we have received from our customers across the board has been favorable. And to the point that you make, Gary, I will confirm that yes, Delta is the only carrier today blocking the middle seats, but those middle seats will stay blocked through the end of April, and then they will be uh, occupied as demand continues to come back. Well done, uh, as a as a flyer myself, I think that's terrific. Could we turn from customer loyalty to scale, and particularly, how do you scale an enormous airline like Delta down as quickly as you had to do it. I know hospitals have had to go through this, of course, uh, and they didn't feel they were particularly well, uh, you know, well educated to do that. They've had to learn that on the fly. But how do you think about scaling down and how did that work? Well, I think there's a difference between hospitals and airports, airplanes, airlines. And that is that during this period of the pandemic, the demand on the hospitals has been great. In my world in aviation, there were very few people flying. I continued to fly throughout the pandemic, but on some of my flights, there might have been five, seven, ten customers between Minneapolis, where I live, and Atlanta, where I work. And I was commuting every week. And so the demand was not there for our service. There certainly was an incredible demand for the medical service. So for us, the scaling down was not hard. 
there wasn't there wasn't much demand anyway. So we could we could put as much social distancing as we wanted. We could put a lot of constraints into the journey uh, through the airport onto the airplane, and it really wouldn't have affected our customers. So scaling down wasn't a problem. What we did have to do is we had to adjust the size of our workforce. We didn't do that through furloughs. We were the only carrier to not furlough. We did that through voluntary unpaid leaves by employees, and we also offered an early retirement package to bring down the employee numbers. We also retired a good number of aircraft. Aircraft that were going to be retiring in a couple of years, we just accelerated the retirement of those aircraft and simplified and consolidated the fleet. There's some benefits to that. There's more consistency in the product. These are more fuel efficient aircraft. We just accelerated that. That was the easy part. The hard part is as demand starts to come back and it's coming back at a pretty good clip, how do you start lifting some of those constraints that you've put in the airport, which were sized for six foot of social distancing, whether it's in the lobby queues or in the TSA checkpoints or around the gate area or the way we board airplanes? How do you start lifting those layers of, uh, of safety that you've put in Knowing that it's still safe, um, uh, but knowing that we still need to keep some of these in place, for example, the mask wearing, how do you keep all of these, uh, or how do you start lifting these layers as demand comes back? That's the real challenging part, knowing where consumers want to fly and knowing what, what frequency, what gauge, uh, how, um, you know, what markets to operate, and then making sure the airports are opened up enough so that uh, we, we can get that, those customers through without having them dwell too much in lines because we know that that's one of the things we want to avoid is we want to keep people moving rather than congregating in big groups. So that's the real challenge for us. And there's just a lot of analysis, a lot of study that we do on a constant basis to adjust our, our capacity along the way. The set of learnings that have gone around, along with scaling down now beginning to scale up how do you store that in the institution's memory so that uh, if something like this happens again, you can go to this storehouse of learnings? In, in our business, we do, we naturally throughout the year, we have some really low periods of flying and then we have some very high periods of flying. For example, I mean, you know, having been in this industry for 32 years, I can tell you it's spring break, then, it's, uh, then it is summer. Then it's Thanksgiving and Christmas. Those are the four periods of the year where you have peak flying. And then on the shoulders of those periods, uh, you have lower volumes, lower levels of flying. So we naturally um, have learned how to scale up and scale down to a smaller degree the airline. What we've done this time around, much of what we have done, we have documented. Um, so we have, we, we develop uh, procedures, we develop um, analyses, we develop uh, studies that ultimately get documented that we can refer to. Some of what we've had to do here over the course of the last year is maybe a magnified version of what we would do during a normal year anyway as we scale up and scale down through those peak periods of time. Um, so we'll refer to exactly how we've done that before and you know, pull out the playbook and uh, execute it uh, in, in, on May, in, a greater, in a greater fashion because we're talking clearly about a much greater change in scale here. You made comment about innovations in various areas uh, over the course of the last year. Can you sustain that, that those innovations over time? I mean, people kind of get worn out after a while, don't they? So is it possible to sustain the level of innovations that you've achieved up to this point? Well, the, the, the changes, the innovations that we have made over the course of the last year, many of them have been focused around cleanliness, sanitization, around spacing, you know, all the things that were very important to customers. Some of those were small in, in nature, some of them a little bit larger, um, but all of them very important to the customer. Some were easy to implement, some were not so easy to implement. As we go forward, uh, the, the changes to uh, all of the cleaning program that we have laid out, all of the innovations there, uh, those are going to continue to be, I think, uh, uh, pretty challenging. You know, one of them is 
you know, as we've been cleaning over the course of the last year, that has required us to leave airplanes on the ground for a longer period of time. We call it ground time. Um, at some point, as demand comes back, we're going to have to shrink that ground time and get back closer to where we were pre-pandemic. What are the innovations? What are the tools? What are the technologies? What are the chemicals that we will be using that will allow our cleaning crews to achieve the same or greater level of cleanliness on board that airplane in a shorter period of time. So we, we've got a lot of innovation going still in the world of cleanliness, and some of those are going to be a bit challenging. The other thing where we're doing, a place where we're doing a lot of innovation is around you know, the digital experience, touchless or contactless interactions with our customers. On board the airplane, when there's a purchase made, today we're the only thing that we're selling on board the airplane is earbuds. But soon as we roll out food and beverage, we're going to be uh, offering some food and beverage for sale as well. What can we do to ensure limited contact between the customer and the flight attendant? Well, we've rolled out what we call tap to pay technology on board the airplane. So no longer does a customer have to hand over their credit card. They can just... Uh, provide their credit card, uh, near field communication credit card, or a phone that has the same capability to allow them to make the payment for whatever it is they're purchasing on board. That technology we're rolling out to airports as well. It'll be in sky clubs at some point. It'll be out at our lobbies at some point. The other thing is facial recognition. Rather than having to you know, use your phone or a, a printed boarding pass, what can we use to, uh, how can we deploy biometrics and, and digital identity to allow a curb to aircraft um, flow rather than having to exchange stuff along the way, whether it's with a Delta agent or it's with the TSA or uh, Customs and Border Protection, whatever we can do to make it contactless. Uh, so we're making some, uh, some investments there and we'll continue to innovate in that space. I'd like to turn to airports for a moment and then go on to leadership to wrap up, Bill. But we were talking earlier, and, and I've seen that Delta's building six or seven major uh, airports, uh, rebuilding major airports. And I think you mentioned there's something like $14 billion uh, being spent on this over a period of years. But um, did that building continue during the pandemic, or did you have to slow that down? Uh, Gary, it not only continued, it accelerated in many instances. So, yes, we have about $14 billion of, of airport facilities investments that are at various stages of completion from the east to the west coast here, north to south in the, in the U.S. Some of our largest locations, LaGuardia, um, Los Angeles, we've got work going on in the Minneapolis hub. Atlanta's constantly been going through renovation. So we, we took the opportunity, while there were few customers transiting our airports last year, we took the opportunity to accelerate. So not only continue the investment, but to accelerate completion, because it was easy to do so. The construction work wasn't getting in the way of the flow of customers because there were very few customers. So as an example, the work that we're doing at T3 and in the head house out uh, in the lobby out in, in LAX, that work is scheduled to be completed 18 to 24 months earlier than originally envisioned because uh, we hit the, the gas pedal and uh, really sped these projects up. We were fully committed to them, as were the airport authorities. We weren't going to back out on that commitment. And being able to accomplish them earlier is going to give our customers more opportunity sooner to enjoy them. Bill, this has been a terrific interview. Let's wrap up, if we could, with a few questions about leadership. Uh, one of them is culture. <clears throat> Pardon me. We spoke about culture earlier, but let me ask that question directly. Uh, during times of great stress, like pandemic that we were under for the last year, how important is culture to the operation of an organization like Delta? Well, I think culture is is always important. It was particularly important over the last year for us because what we were going through, no one had seen before. There was no playbook for this. And we really needed in many instances to just rely very heavily and in some cases almost exclusively on the quality of our people, their capability and the culture that they operate in, which is a culture really around serving humanity, making life better for people, 
whether it's their coworker or their customer, and giving our flight attendants, giving our agents, um, whether they're on the phone or face to face with the customer, giving them the license to do what they think is right to care for the customer under these extraordinary, very unusual, hard to define circumstances. So we lean very heavily on the Delta culture, and that is what I think ultimately has allowed Delta to come through this pandemic, and as we near uh, the backside of this pandemic, allow Delta to come through in a position of brand strength like we have never seen before. Culture was vital to that success. Thinking about teams, how do you think about teams and the importance of teams uh, during a time like uh, like we went through with the pandemic? Well, having grown up as an athlete and knowing that there's, at least in the sports that I played in, there's no one individual who, make, who ultimately affects the outcome of a game. It's no different in the business that I am in. We are a very people-focused, very team-focused operation, and it's really important. Uh, particularly as things are changing so rapidly like they were over the course of the last uh, 12 months. It's really important that everyone feel like they are on the same team. And uh, I, I was sharing with you earlier, Gary, when we had an opportunity to talk a bit, that over the course of the last year, I haven't heard anyone say, that's not my job. Everyone has been focused on understanding what the needs of the customer are, what the needs of the business are, and making sure that we are collectively going at it um, to to ultimately hit or exceed those expectations. If you don't have good teamwork, if you don't have good collaboration, this stuff might happen, but it happens slowly, and you find yourself as a real laggard here. You find yourself frustrating the customer. We've had to band together. We've been forced over this past year to really band together as a team and ultimately um, work together in a world where There were no boundaries about your responsibilities. The only boundary was you need to identify the customer's need and and work as a team to go get it. Last question, Bill. Again, this has been a terrific interview, is listening, which as I talk to leaders, um, you get various points of view on that, but most of them say it's really important to listen, to ask the right questions. How do you think about listening, Bill? Well, I think great leaders demonstrate a couple of really great qualities. One is they are empathetic, and two is they they can demonstrate vulnerability. Uh, I've, I've met very few, if any, great leaders who haven't had those qualities about them. No one is perfect. We don't, there isn't any one individual who understands the, the situation completely and who knows all the answers in response to that, those situations. And so being able to listen to those people whether it's your employees or customers who are out ultimately experiencing the product that you are designing and building and being open to the feedback and making sure that that is included as you make decisions. To me, I've, I've, I've always at least intentionally tried to practice good listening. Over the last year, I've realized the value of it because there were so many things going on in, uh, in the space of the airline uh, industry that I couldn't have understood unless I spent time listening to customers or listening to employees and therefore could not have made an optimum decision for them. And we were making decisions at a very quick pace. So listening in my mind, being empathetic to your employees, being empathetic to your customers and having having the courage to say that you are imperfect, therefore you are vulnerable, vulnerable as a leader and taking all of that and, and, and using it for, for your advantage as a leader to make better decisions, I think, I think that is probably one of the most, if not the, not the most important quality of a leader, is to be a good listener. Bill, I very much enjoyed our conversation today. We, we appreciate your time. Thank you for being with us. Good to be with you, Gary. Thank you so much. All the best to you.